Greetings. I'm very pleased to be a part of this conference, though I regret I was unable to join you in person for this presentation. My name is Megan Sizek, and I am an associate professor in the English for Academic Purposes program at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. I've also been serving as director of the program since 2014. Though I recognize that our teaching context might be different, in this presentation, I want to emphasize the idea of context in considering how and why we teach English in particular ways and what steps might be taken to innovate our teaching so that it is more responsive to best practices in the field, as well as the needs and experiences of the students we teach. To that end, I've entitled this presentation, Finding Spaces for Curricular and Pedagogical Innovation. This keynote is structured as follows. I'll start with reflection. Tracing back my own experiences teaching in different contexts over the last 20 years. As I recount these experiences, I encourage you to do the same so that we can collectively engage in some pedagogic reflection. To prime us to think about teaching for today and into the future. Then I will transition to my current teaching context, articulating where EAP fits within the larger framework of our field and highlighting the work of the EAP program I direct at George Washington University. I'll concentrate specifically on several innovative changes we made to our EAP offerings. From there, I'll tell the story of the edited collection I recently published with the University of Michigan Press, specifically how my work in a primarily writing-focused program led me to curate an edited book about oral academic communication. After describing the four core principles that shaped this collection, I'll provide a snapshot of some innovative practices my co-authors shared in the chapters they wrote. At the end of the presentation, I'll share some recommendations and final thoughts in the hope that it will inspire you to think about curricular and pedagogical innovations in your own contexts. Now join me in a trip through my previous teaching experiences. I've titled this part of the presentation, Decontextualized Contexts, because I think you will see that in each of the three teaching scenarios I describe, the materials and teaching approaches tended to be somewhat disconnected from students' experiences and needs. My first teaching job was at Korea University, a prestigious private university in Seoul. It was a relatively elite, but highly homogeneous student population. I taught seven sections of English language courses per semester, meeting for one hour twice a week. Each section had about 30 students. So this was a total of about 240 students per week. Instead of choosing their own major, students were admitted into a major at this university and took classes as a cohort throughout their program. For example, those with the highest scores on the entrance exam were placed in majors like public policy and law. And those with lower scores were placed into majors like education or home economics. The faculty in my department came from North America, Australia, the United Kingdom, and South Africa. And there were few other foreign instructors on faculty 20 years ago. Though the university has since begun to offer quite a lot of English medium instruction. The classes I taught at Korea University focused on English conversation, mostly listening and speaking. And we used textbooks with names like interactions and let's talk. As far as I remember, the materials were situationally based with functional vocabulary building, short dialogues and role plays, and listening practice followed by comprehension questions. To be honest, the instruction neither prepared students for real interaction in English, nor did it reflect any sort of academic use of language. My second teaching job was in an intensive English program at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. 
This was part of the university, but students had not been accepted into a degree program. The students in this program came from all around the world, but our largest student populations came from South America and East Asia. Most students hope to gain enough English language proficiency to be admitted to a US university. So this curriculum was more academically oriented than the one at Korea University, but the instruction was still separated out by skills with students studying for 20 hours a week in three different courses, listening plus speaking, reading plus writing and grammar. Although some of these skills were integrated and some of the materials and topics were more academic, the instruction was still quite generic. And we used books that focused on the different skill areas, such as an academic writing text or a book full of basic grammar instruction and exercises. There was no alignment across the courses within the curriculum. In fact, students could be taking one level of a reading and writing course and taking a different level of the speaking listening course. This program also incorporated social and cultural elements with field trips to sites around the city on Fridays. My next teaching job and the place I still remain is George Washington University. The EAP program here is housed in the College of Arts and Sciences and we teach credit bearing courses to fully matriculated students across schools and levels at the university. In other words, our EAP students are enrolled in degree programs at the university and take EAP along with their other university classes. Most students take only one EAP class during their first semester of study, a requirement that is determined based on their TOEFL or equivalent scores upon admission to the university. Our classes meet twice a week for 75 minutes each session. Though some of our classes use a writing reference book and our upper level graduate writing class uses the seminal graduate writing text written by Swales and Feek. We tend not to rely on textbook based instruction, instead developing our own syllabi, curating materials and creating our own tasks and assignments. Reflecting my path as an English instructor helps us visualize the interrelationships among subfields that fall under the larger TESOL umbrella. ESL is perhaps the most commonly known in the US, but is usually associated with immigrants to the US who need to develop practical language skills to function in society. EFL is the most similar to what I taught at Korea University and is also probably common to university students' experiences in Brazil. Students may take a semester or multiple semesters of English as a foreign language to develop a basic conversational competency, much like students in the US might take Spanish, Portuguese, or German. I'll talk more on the next slide about the definition of EAP and what characterizes EAP pedagogy. But the main difference between EAP, ESL, and EFL is the academic orientation. It is deeply aligned with L2 writing, second language writing, arguably a discipline in and of itself with an active scholarly and professional community, one that I actively participate in. And EAP, especially at the graduate level, is also closely related to the field of English for specific purposes, ESP, in which students or professionals learn the English that is specific or particular for communication within their own disciplines or fields. This could be English for engineering, English for the hospitality industry, or even the English learned and used by pilots who fly us around the world. The work I currently do is grounded in the field of EAP, which involves the teaching of English in specialized academic contexts to develop students' capacity for further study in English, and also promotes students' familiarization with the target academic culture. At the undergraduate level, this usually involves the use of academic English across the curriculum, 
But at the graduate level context, it's more specialized and students are under considerable pressure to develop awareness of the discourse conventions of their own disciplines and gain membership into this community. EAP pedagogy is characterized by its use of authentic and academically purposed tasks and materials, its genre and task-based pedagogy, where larger projects are broken down into scaffolded steps. EAP also involves the development of students' academic literacy skills. For example, making sure they understand how to conduct library research, evaluate sources, and integrate and cite sources in their academic work. And finally, EAP focus, focuses on teaching lexicogrammatical aspects of academic language use, including academic text construction and vocabulary use in context. With these understandings in mind, let's talk a bit more about our program's core offerings and later how we innovated these offerings to better reflect the context in which our students may need to communicate in English. As I mentioned before, our courses are for students who have been admitted into a degree program at the university. A certain subset of international students are required to take an EAP class during their first semester of study based on university policy. You'll notice that all of our required core courses are writing focused. And we've offered these same courses to international students for many years. The next part of my presentation will outline some of the ways we have innovated our offerings in, G in GW's EAP program in recent years. Knowing that university policy dictated that we offer three required writing courses I just introduced, we wanted to think of spaces to innovate our offerings to make our instruction more targeted and relevant for the diverse students that we teach. So I'm going to tell a brief story about four of these innovations, starting with the undergraduate level writing class and concluding with the oral academic communication class that inspired me to pull together the edited collection I will talk about later. When I first started teaching at GW, our undergraduate writing course was not dissimilar to the writing class in the intensive English program I taught at in North Carolina, at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. It used a relatively generic textbook with quasi-academic topics and prompts for essay-based writing, sometimes following the somewhat outdated modes approach, for example, writing a narrative essay, a descriptive essay, a process essay, et cetera. In addition, it also counted for the university writing requirement, meaning international students who completed the EAP course did not have to take the first year writing course that every other undergraduate student took. Thus, they missed out on a key socializing experience for new students. We did not want international students to be segregated from this important learning experience, so we determined that the EAP writing course would no longer count as an equivalent for first year writing. We also wanted this class to have more relevance to the writing expectations of the US undergraduate curriculum and prepare international students who speak English as a second or additional language for success in the rigorous intellectually themed first year writing course they would take the semester after EAP. We thus reconceived and restructured the course so that it had a more unified content focus. In this case, exploring the rich cultural history of our capital city. The course also focuses on building students' genre and rhetorical awareness, their ability to find, integrate, and cite sources, and develop their capacity to produce a variety of written genres across the curriculum including a conceptual definition, a summary and critique of an academic source, an interpretation of a poem about DC, a short analytical paper, 
and a comparative analysis research paper in which students relate an element of their home country's capital city to Washington, DC. After a number of years teaching this new version of the undergraduate writing course, we have found that EAP students perform quite well in the rigorous first year writing course that follows, with 40% earning grades in the A range and approximately 80% of students earning a B or higher. I also engaged in a hermeneutic phenomenological research study of 10 EAP students during the semester that they took the theme-based first-year writing course and gained many insights into their lived experiences. More information about this study and its surrounding context can be found in my book, International Students in First-Year Writing, A Journey Through Socioacademic Space. The second curricular innovation our EAP program made was converting certain sections of our required graduate level academic writing and research courses into discipline specific ones. This decision was based on two key factors. First, the graduate students we taught in EAP were most likely to come from STEM fields. So we saw a real opportunity to to develop instruction that met their needs. Second, we looked to the fields of EAP and more specifically ESP to determine the most effective and strategic approach to course design. Based on this, we engaged in a process of needs analysis that included document review, for example, reviewing materials, textbooks, syllabi, and scholarly research, meetings with stakeholders such as deans and department chairs to make sure that we had support and buy-in, more targeted surveys and interviews with program faculty and former students, all of which guided our approach to course design. The result was that in addition to our regular sections of graduate EAP for students from across schools and programs, we created three specialized sections that students could opt to take. Though we covered a number of the same core skills in these specialized sections, we aim to have much more of a disciplinary and professional approach to materials and assignments. The first new course we developed was for students in a Master's of Science in Finance program with tasks and assignments such as a finance in the news presentation, writing a resume and cover letter, delivering an elevator speech, and the final project as a financial analysis. The second was for graduate students in quantitative fields such as statistics and data science, in which we targeted assignments such as a definition short assignment, a data problem statement, an interview with an expert, and a recommendation report as the final project. And the most recent discipline-specific course we developed was for students from our School of Applied Sciences and Engineering, which focused on an engineering process assignment, a class participation report, a panel discussion, and a research report as the final project. The third pedagogical innovation our program undertook was developing online summer EAP courses, which allowed international students to complete their EAP requirement online from their home country prior to arriving on campus to begin their graduate studies at GW. These courses were designed to reflect core principles of online literacy instruction including the importance of pedagogical needs determining the use of technology, the increasing expectation for digital and multimodal communication, and the importance of interaction and community building in online learning contexts. We received instructional design support from the university to develop these asynchronous summer classes, all of which passed the Quality Matters Review. 
Since we developed these courses, we have found that student learning outcomes for the online courses are comparable to those in our face-to-face -face sections of the course. As documented in a research study my colleague Dmitry Stankovich and I wrote in 2019. You may have noticed a trend here in terms of the areas that EAP seems to have the most weight or value in US higher education curricula, which got me thinking. While there's been a growing interest in oral communication across the disciplines in the undergraduate curriculum, writing is by far the most common curricular requirement across North American higher education. And many universities invest in writing centers to offer students additional support. Similarly, many institutions, including mine, offer required academic writing courses for second language international students, but rarely offer credit or required courses that require speaking, which again signals the value placed on written communication in institutional settings. In addition, the burgeoning field of graduate communication reflects a recent interest in scholarship, pedagogy and institutional support for graduate students, but the focus on writing remains far more prevalent than on oral communication. A focus on writing also predominates our scholarly research and teaching materials. So though sometimes overshadowed by a curricular focus on academic writing in higher education, oral communication is increasingly acknowledged as being central to students' academic and professional success. This reflects not only communication necessary for managing academic tasks and assignments, but also, as Patricia Duff noted in 2010, the growing importance of collaboration and communication, and not just textbook knowledge and theory, that are now required in real-world knowledge building and knowledge sharing in a variety of professional and academic fields. Thus, better understanding the landscape for oral academic communication and developing innovative pedagogical approaches is key to responding to students' dynamic communication needs. So in considering the next curricular innovation, I dug more deeply into some literature about communication across the undergraduate curriculum. Though as noted previously, writing has been the primary cur curricular concern for a long time, there are growing calls for students to develop oral communication competence across disciplines. Duff and others have also argued that discourse socialization is increasingly diverse, dynamic, and socially situated, now involving elements that are multimodal, multilingual, and intertextual. Genres have evolved along similar lines. In line with my own scholarship, we also need to consider the importance of global and intercultural communication in our teaching. With this in mind, I'd like to explain one more program level curricular innovation, the creation of a new academic oral academic EAP course that fulfills a general education requirement at the university. When developing this course, I wanted to make sure that it was systematically conceived and that it reflected speaking contexts and genres that were authentic and relevant for undergraduate international students from various backgrounds, schools, and potential majors. I also wanted to build in a unifying thematic focus. And in conceiving this class, I saw an opportunity not just to draw on an interdisciplinary internationalized course theme that valued students' linguistic and cultural assets, but also an opportunity to help students develop 21st century literacies, including familiarity with multimodal and visual communication. 
to support their success across the curriculum and their participation in our globally interconnected world. This course is organized into three modules, each lasting four to five weeks. And the course components build upon one another over the course of the semester, meaning the concepts, skills, and genres we tackle earlier in the semester are utilized or repurposed as the course progresses. This table provides a snapshot of the course structure with brief descriptions of sample tasks and modalities used. The first course module relates to understanding and analyzing the communicative environment of U.S. higher education. Early activities are relatively informal, giving students opportunities to work in pairs, to get to know one another, explore the university, build their rhetorical and genre awareness, and become familiar with the genres they may be asked to consume and produce as undergraduate students in a U.S. university. We also experiment with user-friendly technologies during this module. The second course module focuses on working with authentic academic content to ensure that students can communicate their ideas and engage in critical discussion. Tasks and assignments in this module require that students are more self-directed and assume leadership roles in team activities and discussions. At the same time, students begin to listen and respond to longer and more complex multimedia material and experiment with new technologies such as VoiceThread, a platform embedded in our university's learning management system that allows students to engage multimodally through the sharing of video, voice, media, and text commenting. The third course module extends the skills developed in the previous modules, and students are expected to engage with more complex academic tasks and a longer presentation. The overarching goal of this last module is that students learn to communicate their ideas in logical, persuasive, clear, and visually appealing ways with a strong sense of audience awareness and academic authority. This slide contains screenshots of the most significant assignments students worked on during the modules of the course. During the first module of the course, students complete a digital literacy narrative in which they're asked to create a five minute digital story chronicling their language journey, a kind of linguistic autobiography and its intersection with English language learning. Digital stories systematically integrate complex content, semiotic resources, and students' narrative voice. With multimedia tools such as images, music, graphics, and audio recordings, thus promoting 21st century digital literacies in line with course learning objectives. These digital literacy narratives give voice to students' multiple and sometimes conflicting language experiences and offer insights into the powerful linguistic and cultural forces that have shaped their paths. Not only does this assignment provide students a powerful opportunity to express themselves creatively and get to know one another, but it also primes them to reflect on their experiences in our globally interconnected society and recognize the generative potential of cultural and linguistic diversity. The most significant assignment of the second module is the discussion leadership assignment in which each student takes turns selecting a relevant source material, usually a TED talk on a global or intercultural theme, and then crafts four discussion questions in order to facilitate a 20 minute discussion in class. We approach this discussion leadership as a genre uh, with targeted analysis of the audience and purpose, a three-part organizational structure, and the use of genre-appropriate lexico-grammatical structures for both facilitating and participating in the discussion. This assignment gives students considerable control over and responsibility for the source material they select. And all participants are able to co-construct knowledge and share their own cultural and linguistic perspectives and experiences with their classmates. 
students have selected source material that focuses on topics such as the relationship between language and cognition, the dominance of global English, language loss, and the need for collective action to solve global problems. The most significant assignment during module three is the individual persuasive presentation, which we work on step-by-step step over the course of approximately five weeks. In this presentation, students make a persuasive proposal to an imagined audience of high-level university administrators that recommends a new curricular or co-curricular initiative to advance global and or intercultural learning at the university through an examination of their own home culture, however they define it. In essence, students are pitching a well-researched initiative that promotes internationalization at GW, which means students need to conduct research about internationalization and global learning more broadly, as well as make sure they have a firm understanding of the university's institutional context and elements of their home culture that the initiative focuses on. For this presentation, students have proposed initiatives such as a three event co-curricular program on anti-Asian bias during the time of COVID, a new interdisciplinary course on the K-pop phenomenon, and a short-term summer abroad program where students travel to South Asia to learn about economic development. Highlighted on this slide are some of the assessment outcomes of the oral academic communication course we designed. As you can see, the students in this class did very well achieving the three key learning objectives required for the general education curricular requirement. And on the right of the slide, you can see some of students' narrative comments about the course. They appreciated that the course emphasized the global world and diversity and that it allowed them to express their minds and knowledge. They found the course helpful to their academic success and their ability to meet demands for oral communication across their other classes. Students also uniformly commented on gains in their confidence and their fluency in speaking, their increasing genre and rhetorical awareness, and their favorite assignments of the course um, frequently were mentioned as the three I just discussed, the digital literacy narrative, the student-led discussion, and the individual persuasive presentation. They liked these assignments the most because they enabled them to express their own ideas in their own voice, in their own way, and have some control over what they talked about. Um, students also mentioned the importance of learning about visual communication and design and gained important skills in the use of technology for communication. The next part of the presentation focuses on how my interest in developing that oral communication course led me to a new book proposal with the University of Michigan Press. Two questions struck me in the process of developing that new curricular innovation. First, to what extent are we applying what drives our approach to second language writing to oral academic communication? And second, how can we promote an understanding of what is currently happening in our field when it comes to teaching oral academic communication? So this volume that I conceived creates a space for us to share our knowledge, pedagogical approaches, and relevant research results with others in our community and beyond. It's extremely important for us to acknowledge that academic discourse socialization involves both written and oral communication. And we as TESOL specialists need to advocate for its value in our curricula and our collective scholarship. Thus, the purpose of this book was to gather TESOL scholars and practitioners in exploring the principles and practices that both ground and help innovate the teaching of oral communication in a range of contexts in higher education. 
This slide visualizes the four core principles that shaped the collection. At the core, oral communication in higher education is a form of academic discourse socialization in which new members are socialized into their new academic discourse community through mediate interactions with others. Through this process, students come to learn the communicative practices that allow them to participate in these spaces. This process of socialization can be enormously complex, influenced by factors such as content knowledge, linguistic and rhetorical capacity, affective considerations, and identity and power dynamics. The second key principle grounding this edited collection is context responsive instruction, with particular emphasis on recognizing the various socio-academic spaces in which students are expected to communicate inside the classroom, outside the classroom, and even in virtual spaces, and designing instruction that reflects these contexts and targets their relevant genres. The third core principle is harnessing the strengths of English for academic purposes and English for specific purposes in our teaching of oral academic communication, as demonstrated through practices such as needs analysis and the use of authentic materials and tasks and a focus on authentic language use in context. Finally, the pedagogical innovations put forth in this edited volume embody the value of an asset-oriented approach to teaching, recognizing the challenges students face while at the same time honoring their linguistic and cultural strengths and promoting their agency within their new discourse community. On this slide, I'd like to provide a snapshot of some key innovative practices that were described in the edited collection. On the undergraduate level, in addition to the oral communication class I described earlier, which I write about in chapter one of the book, we learn about the ways global interconnections are being embedded into teaching and learning. Preshaus and Akpobi's chapter reflects opportunities for discipline-specific oral communication at the undergraduate level through presentations involving digital communication and international business content, with the goal of preparing international students in the UK for the global workforce. Preparing students to inhabit a shared global community was also a theme in the approach described by your colleagues, Silva de Santos and Maia, in which Brazilian EFL students apply design thinking principles to collaboratively engage in a series of oral communication tasks, proposing solutions to societal problems. At the graduate level, Davies, Carter, and Campbell describe a sequence of short genre-based presentations using content from students' fields, including professional introductions, concept definitions, data commentary, and process explanations, built to a larger public presentation for an interdisciplinary audience. Murphy and Weekly describe a course in which interdisciplinary content from sociolinguistics is used as the basis for a fieldwork project for graduate students from a variety of fields, culminating in the design of a poster presentation that students share at a gallery walk. We also saw chapters focusing on cross-disciplinary collaborations. As described by Gillette and McNish, a creative element is built into a co-taught EAP course by EAP and theater department faculty, focusing on drama and performance-based genres, and enabling students to perform fluency as they develop confidence as speakers. We also see new attention paid to the role cross-disciplinary partnerships and peer mentoring can play in a highly specialized disciplinary context, as described in Bay, Vols, Wilson, and Parsons chapter about a newly designed graduate seminar that prepares computer science PhD students for research presentations. 
Recent pedagogical approaches also target less formal but still important oral communication activities, such as law school office hours and networking events. And chapters also reveal how communication support programs outside of the classroom, though nowhere near as prevalent as writing centers, offer new opportunities for engaged oral communication support that promotes agency on the part of students. This slide highlights some field specific trends that have motivated recent innovations in teaching and learning. First, we see an increasing focus on discipline specific writing and communication, for example, ESP, especially at the graduate level. Uh, second, scholars assert the centrality of oral academic communication across the undergraduate curriculum as well as in interdisciplinary and specialized disciplinary contexts. We also need to recognize that not all communication takes place in the classroom or in standard ways. Academic discourse, socialization, and interaction occurs in formal and informal settings in multiple modalities. Next, there's a growing focus on visual and multimodal communication, promoting 21st century global literacies to support participation in our globally interconnected world. Similarly, more concern is being paid to internationalization, global mindedness, intercultural communication in teaching, learning, and scholarship. And finally, I and others can continue to advocate for linguistically responsive instruction that builds critical language awareness and values the contribution of diverse students in our learning community. Such instruction considers culturally and linguistically diverse students as key resources in advancing global and cross-cultural learning and values language diversity as an asset. In the curricular innovations I described earlier, we were not creating something brand new. We worked within the confines of our program's existing curriculum, in the case of the theme-based writing and discipline-specific graduate level courses, or within the university's general education curriculum in developing and proposing the oral communication course that would fulfill a requirement that all students needed to graduate. We also leveraged the university's interest in developing high quality summer online courses and additional special summer programs that I did not have time to mention. What was important in making all of this happen was to be able to articulate and substantiate their value for international students, for the EAP program, and for the broader university. Similarly, the chapter authors in the book took advantage of spaces in their institutional context to develop pedagogical approaches for oral academic communication. Though I did not have time to do justice to each approach, the chapters themselves provide more comprehensive information about the theoretical principles that shaped the approach, the instructional context, the details of the approach and how they evaluated its effectiveness, as well as recommendations or considerations for others who may consider taking a similar path. So if you wanna think about innovations in your own local teaching context, here are some guiding questions to consider. First, what does communication in English look like now and into the future? Where are my students coming from? What are their experiences and needs? And where are they going? Both academically and professionally, practically and aspirationally. Are there ways to make the deeper changes that are needed? If so, 
Who should be in the room? What allies might you have? What evidence will you need? What will your next steps be? Sometimes it's not possible to make deep changes. And if you can't, what are the ways we can make smaller changes within our existing curricular and pedagogical frameworks? I'd like to conclude my presentation with some final thoughts that I conveyed at the end of the introductory chapter of the edited collection. Each chapter in this book was a story in its own right, and arranged collectively, they give us insights into the principles that ground the teaching of oral academic communication in academic settings, and the ways in which TESOL practitioners have innovated their practices within their local contexts. Chapter authors in the book show a thoughtful awareness of their own students across space and time their cultural and linguistic pasts, their educational presence, their global futures. This reflects my view that innovation comes from knowing what grounds our work, surveying our current landscape, and scanning the horizon for opportunities. Part of our responsibility as TESOL practitioners is to prepare our students to navigate the communicative demands of their academic and professional communities with an increasing sense of agency and rhetorical capacity. In this sense, we empower students to manage the discursive expectations of their current programs of study while giving them tools to adapt to the discourse communities they may encounter in the future. It is my hope that by listening to this presentation, and I hope at some point reading the book, you will find ideas that will change your perspective, help you innovate your own pedagogy, and inspire you to find spaces within your curriculum or campus where you can advocate for the importance of instruction that supports students' oral and written academic discourse socialization. I'm also including on this slide a discount code that you can use if you want to buy the book. Uh, this last slide contains some of the references that I referred to during this presentation. And my email address is here at the bottom. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions or comments. I hope the presentation uh, go well at the conference for everyone else. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you.